Um, the next speaker is Dr. Babi Osili. Oh, we are taking one speaker before tea break. Yes. So the next speaker is Dr. Babi Osili. As I earlier mentioned, Dr. Babi Osili is a uh, the head of the Department of International Relations, uh, Federal University of Kashari. Uh, he's a political economist and he said uh, University of Nehutuli for his first degree, Bio University of for his master's degree, and he did his PhD in the University of Tara, Malaysia. Dr. Babi also is specialized in political economy and political theory uh, with special interest in Nigeria's elections before I go into the content of my presentation, I would like to express my deep appreciation to the Our Institute for finding me what presentation is such a blessed uh, discourse and just I also want to borrow from the words of our father and our lento barrister at Tahir that uh, in their own legal magazine you can own or possess what others are presented so I am now owning and possessing what all the three speakers so far have presented I don't have any issue with them but uh, in total consensus with them. I think uh, if we stop here, uh, I don't think we need more, but just uh, for the sake of uh, additional discussion, being, being trained from the discipline of political science, uh, I will draw our attention to the fact that I think maybe what is leading to these arguments issues about this issue of democracy and Islam, I think, is a lack of x ray the democracy itself. Maybe if we look at the skeletal perspective of it, we should be able to understand whether there is anything contradictory or there is anything new or the impact. I think in my own contemporary classification, which maybe later we should share, there is what is missing. Maybe what is happening is we are not responding, as the last speaker mentioned. If we are responding, if you look at the littleness of literature, body of literature that is now polluting the world, it is a simple fact that we are not countering or we are not responding accordingly. That is why we are not saying our own version of democracy or system or whatever. So that is why some are thinking that liberal democracy is just the last alternative or something that we must do or not do. Now, first of all, I think we need to understand what the term democracy is. Because even in the Western literature, democracy has never enjoyed an unassailable consensus or support. Indeed, it will be surprising to know that the root of democracy is where it received the most strange criticism of it as a system. There is nowhere where democracy received such a threat, a criticism, like from the Greek scholars, and that is where they say it originated from. And so it is continuous. In as much as there are numerous literature to support or to defend democracy, there are those equal number from the same Western literature against democracy. So we need to understand this. So the previous speakers already explained, but maybe what we need to understand is the democracy itself has not been given a uniform or sacrosanct definition or meaning. And that is why it is established in different structures, different systems, different institutions, and different styles that are not necessarily working in the same way. In fact, that is why some of the Western scholars are now saying that 
you can no longer distinguish between democracy and monarchy or authoritarianism. You just look at the principles. Even in some states where they are not operating democracy, once the principles are obtainable, today it is democracy. So gradually they are collapsing the term liberal democracy by becoming a little bit flexible and liberal as they claim to be. So democracy is a Greek word converted into English, demo and kratos. Demo means people, kratos means rule. So it is simply means ruled by people. Because in those Greek city-states, what they did is they take a decision involving all members of the state, but those that are qualified. And what maybe the literature are not telling us is that the Greek version of democracy is a disenfranchised version of democracy. It's not a liberal one. It's not even up to the level of the socialist one. Because only adult men are qualified to vote. Women, foreigners, slaves, and children are not allowed to vote. So it's not a total democracy as we are led to believe it originated from Greek, from this. So that is why uh, you can see that it, it has received a lot of criticism by Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates to the extent that if we stop there, we will have been saved our energy by those, the champions of democracy and their philosophers. But different scholars in the Western world came up with their own different version. For example, John Locke is generally attributed as the father of liberal democracy, who believed that liberal democracy simply means you relinquish some part, very few part, maybe 10 or 20 percent of your liberty to some people to represent you, but you retain the majority aspect of the liberty. To such an extent that John Locke is of the view that you don't even need to wait for a periodic election. If the representative, your people are not giving you the much desired representation, you have the right to withdraw your liberty, to withdraw their leadership, and then identify another one. That is why he's identified as the father of liberalism. But not the only one. The other one, like Jeremy Bentham, is an English philosopher. He, in his own part, believed that democracy is a process of achieving the greatest happiness of the greatest number. It's a majority rule by the what, greatest number. So if the majority, according to Bentham, are, not even, are no longer in support or in romance, with democratic system, then you make a U-turn. In fact, the most liberal of them is even J.S. Mill, who believed that because of the absolute liberty that an individual is expected to enjoy in the society, if you feel that you are an alcohol addict, you need to go and intoxicate yourself as much as you wish. You have the right to go and do it to the extent that if you want to harm somebody, the society should take care of you. But nobody should block you from your liberty. So all these are the intellectual foundations or roots that led to the emergence of contemporary Western democracy. But the over-ambitions of them, Karl Marx, believe that it is even the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is impracticable. That even the democratic system, that you don't even need leaders. What you need just workers' union, workers' association, who can take decision on behalf of workers in the society. So you dictate to the society and to yourself how the polity and the economy can be designed. So you don't even need leadership. In fact, he even uh, predicted that the society will wither away. There is a time when the state will disappear. Because you don't need a government, you don't need state structure, all that you need is an organized labor, a working class, which is not practicable. They say, because even the communist and socialist state of China and Russia are not designed based on the model anticipated by Karl Marx. In fact, the Chinese and Russian revolution are just replacement of one class of elite by another class of elite and not the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat as anticipated by Marx. 
So these are some few. So in, if you summarize or sum up all these views, democracy is simply a system of government according to one of the founding writers on democracy, particularly in America, Alexis de Tocqueville, that democracy is a system of government that promotes political equality, economic liberty, and political liberty. That is what democracy uh, propels to promote. And then, if you come back, as I said, I didn't even, want, even believe in the first place that this Western version of democracy, or liberal democracy, is something that you start arguing or debating whether it is compatible with Islam or not, because there is even no need for comparison. We now develop or we agree that there is an Islamic democracy, different from the Western liberal or socialist or whatever democracy. In fact, the classification of democracy now is beyond liberal and social. Apart from the Islamic democracy, we also have what we call the developing or emerging democracies. They also have their own systems, structures, and institutions separate from the this one designed in the Western world. So how I think we need to look at how democracy evolved. Now democracy evolved, they say, from the Greek city-state. But some literature are of the view that democracy predated the Greek city-state. You cannot say for sure that the societies that pre-existed before the Greek city-state and offered did not practice some part of their own democratic system. But the only reason why there is a consensus always pointing toward Greek city-state is simple. It's just because that was the first time that there were philosophical, intellectual, and practical record of the democratic system. But if you look at it, while democracy was being practiced in the city-state, the great trial of Athens, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle attacked the Greek city-state. In essence, I have this view that if Plato lives during the era of Islam, I have no doubt that he will be a Muslim. Because what Plato pro projected as an alternative form of government to democracy is just typical of the Islamic Khilafah system. Because according to him, democracy, they say, is a, a decision by the majority. And then the majority lack the skill, the sophistication, and the way of will to determine what is good or what is bad, or who will even make a good leader or a bad leader. We are all witness to, for example, electoral process in Nigerian state. Majority that are deciding on who will be your leader are not the ones that are the most sophisticated of us. Majority or some of them are voting just because of my gi, indomie, some Tokyo, whatever, not motivated by the desire to install a leadership because of maslaha. So therefore, Plato believed that what we need is a philosopher king. And who is that philosopher king? with the desire for justice. That's why I say it's more closer to Islamic Lapa. Not only a philosopher king, but a philosopher king with the desire for justice. And according to him, that philosopher king is a leader with knowledge, with wisdom, and then with the capability to discharge justice. And what is that justice according to him? The ability to do unto others what you want them to do unto you, and the ability to restrain from doing unto others what you don't want them to do unto you. I think it's a very straightforward definition of justice. If you as a leader can do unto the followers what you want them to do unto you, and you restrain yourself from doing unto them what you don't want them to do unto you, I think it's the absolute level of justice. Then come Aristotle. Aristotle also attacked that the same Greek democracy that they have been practicing under his word. Why? Because according to him, it has even been corrupted. Because there was a time when some influential rich men in those cities that used to give money in order to get elected into some assemblies. 
And at the end of the day, according to him, whosoever engages in the process of board buying, he will also engage in the process of making profit. So not the best system. He too provided an alternative that is similar to a sure council, a government by few who will take this shot. Now from the great city state, the next state of the evolution of democratic system in the history of the world is in the Roman kingdom, where they call what we call the Senate. So the Senate in modern time emerged from the Rome, where they vote. But even in Rome still, it is not a liberal democracy because as in the case of Greek city-state, women, slaves, and foreigners are not entitled to vote. So only people can vote for the senators. But also that version of democracy was believed to have been corrupted because the senators used to bribe or buy their way into power. So in the long run, they no longer represent the public, but they represent themselves. Now, something is missing. There is a gap in between the Greek city-state, the Roman democracy, and the Western liberal democracy. And that is what we are not telling the world, the Islamic democracy. Of course, if you look at the Islamic system, it is a system which is all-encompassing. It is a system which is based on Sharia, on justice, on the overall promotion of the welfare of the government. And if you look at the processes, in the first place, those that argue that Islamic system is a demo Islamic democracy, they believe that there are many ways, as, as discussed by the first speaker, Professor Zun there are many ways that leaders succeeded into power in the Islamic context for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are some believe that even the choice of the Prophet as divine leaders is democratic because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chose those that are the best of us. If he threw it often, for an election, maybe we may not get the prophet that we got. So Allah himself decided to democratically select for us. So that is the first version of Islamic democracy. Then the prophets, they all govern, or let us just narrow down our discussion to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a democratic leader. And as widely observed, even by some Western scholars like Michael H. Hart, is the only leader so far that succeeded in integrating the secular and the religious version of life, lived them together successfully, and bequeathed such type of life and leadership to his own followers, which we are still doing today. In Islam, there is no distinguishing line between the economy, politics, culture, and social aspect. They are interwoven, disentangled, and interconnected. Within your politics, within your economy, within your culture, within the social aspect, you will still find spiritualism in it. So the best form of democracy, which is encompassing everything, the Western democracy, as rightly observed by Dr. Bugaji, could not be able to contain, because they are man-made, could not be able to contain secularism and religion altogether. That is why they separated them. But the Islamic democracy successfully contained them, and even beyond. So that is it. So, and when it comes to the issue of secession, there is a reason why the secession was, was left open. It was not in a vacuum or mistake. In fact, if as important as leadership is, if there must be a definite way. There must be only one variety. There is no alternative. Quran will have stated that all Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will have designed that for us. But it was not often so that we should have flexibility because the Quran was quite aware that our society will continue to evolve yeah, and will continue to grow from one perspective to another. So that is why it was left often. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr emerged by consensus, Sayyidina Umar by nomination, Sayyidina Usman by the Shura Council, and that Shura is a typical of the electoral college currently practiced in America. 
Just the exact version. The only difference is that people were asked to go and vote, but at the end of the day, your vote did not even count as much as that of the Electoral College. For example, in 2016, Hillary Clinton scored extra 2.6 million votes ahead of those of Donald Trump. But because he scored more number of Electoral College, 327, he emerged the winner, the President of America. The same thing with uh, Al Gore and George Bush, Jr. So it's an electoral college. It's a sure they adopted. So therefore, even the Western democracy itself, the reason why we need to think of Islamic democracy is that it does not have a consensus. If you look at the liberal system itself, for example, some practice presidential system, some parliamentary system, some constitutional monarchy like Britain, some a mixture of both presidential and parliamentary like Italy and France. Some they practice federalism, some they practice unitary system. They have their own different version even within the Western liberal democracy. If you go to the Western socialist democracy, it is more of a uniform system because they only have one party system, they have one manifesto, whatever. But even those one too, they have their own different system. For example, in Russia, it is the workers' union that are representing the political parties. In China, it is expanded beyond the worker, workers' union. And if you come down to, they say now there is another classification, developing countries or emerging democracies, where they are authoritarian. What we are operating in theory is democracy, but in practice is a version that we still do not have a name for it up to now. We just call it democracy, but in theory, in practice, it is something else. So the beauty of democracy, according to most of those that are defending it, is for the simple fact that it provides an absolute liberty, multi-party system, effective participation, periodic election. You have alternative, you have choices, you have the right to voice what you want to say or whatever. So that is now the aspect where there is an argument, that is the juristic perspective between the scholars of Islam and Jews, because some that are kicking against democracy, as I said earlier, maybe they didn't believe that there is an Islamic democracy. We believe in it, so that's why we don't dwell much in the argument to even waste time that Islam is not compatible with democracy, whatever. But in the first place, they have this view that that sovereignty is transferred from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the world to the people or to the government. This cannot be true in an Islamic society. It's not necessary that you must transfer the sovereignty. Who stops Islamic countries and societies from practicing Sharia? In fact, even the Western colonial countries, Europe, they didn't block us from practicing Sharia under their system. They went and made a system. In Nigeria, for example, we still have the Sharia system. If, for example, today, if major state governor, for example, today decide that he will operate Sharia law, nobody constitution cannot stop him because that constitution provides that law there. So the issue of transparent sovereignty should not even arise here because there is no any, no matter even a minor view that any aspect of Islam agrees that there is any source of law or governing people rather than Sharia. No any view. I think I have a hand on them. I have even even seen an alpha. They never even present any contradictory view. No any view is saying that Sharia should not be the source of law for Islam and for Muslims. And it can be operated under any system. You can operate Sharia under monarchy. You can operate it under democracy. You can operate it even under military. It was even operated in Pakistan under military rulers. So you can operate it in any system. So therefore, it's not a point of contradiction here. The second aspect is that in the case of democracy, some are saying that that issue of opposition and multi-party system is not healthy for the Islamic system because Islam is always about the unity of the Ummah. But in a liberal democracy, there are parties, there is an opposition, and you know sometimes what the opposition does is to create disunity, confusion, chaos. So because of this, 
uh, that liberal democracy will not be a good system, but even that one, still the response is that it is not necessary that you must adopt multi-party system if you want to preserve unity in the society. There are many states, even the oldest democracies in Europe like Russia, China, and many others that are operating only one party system. There are many African states today that are operating one party system. So you may operate that if you wish, and you can even operate the multi-party. On the issue of opposition, I think if you go back to the history of Islam, even during the Umayyad dynasty, the Abbasid, during the Patmid, Seljuks, the Safavid, before the establishment of the Ottoman Empire, there was opposition in many aspects. In fact, even one day, then, even one day, we are united under the Sultan. For example, the Seljuk state, still the tribes and the clans were allowed and were given autonomy to make decisions that concerns their well-being and their environment, provided those decisions were not colliding with the interests of the state. And sometimes they used to oppose maybe what the state want or the state will oppose what these tribes and clans made their own decision on. So therefore, and on the issue of man-made laws, the current debate, or those that are against democracy in Islam are saying that we are all based on man-made laws. But then there are some religious clerics that believe that man-made laws are allowed because what? There were already the existence of Kiyas, Istima, Istihad, and so many other man-made laws based on the consideration of the environment, the situation, and the nature. For example, if you say that democracy is not compatible with Islam, there are many societies today that are Islamizing democracy. One of the models is that adopted in Tunisia by Rashid Ghalichi, who established his own Islamic party called El Nahada. That Islamic party is now operating based on Islamic principle. There is the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. There is the, even the Malaysian National Party, United Malaysian National Organization. It's more designed based on Islamic principles in ruling, in outlook. Even though, to show you how flexible they are, they used to enter into collision with Chinese, with Indians, in order to secure power. But once on power, the Sharia principle is there and they operate with Islamic law. So you can operate that. So based on this therefore, I think there are three alternative models that the Islamic societies can approach. If we decided to operate democracy, we can do either establishment, or we can do deliberation, or we can do participation. We can do establishment by establishing parties structures and institutions design them based on Islamic principles and continue to operate and govern ourselves on that. And it can be democracy. We can have periodic elections and even the periodic election. The argument is in the case of Islamic clapper sometimes normally the caliphs only left all the areas after death. Even in the current Western democratic system there are many societies that operate a lifetime democratic system. For example, in China now, Xi Jinping is now declared the national party of the national leader of the Communist Party, which by implication means he can continue to contest till death. In Russia, for example, there is no limit now. There, in Malaysia, there is no limit, and it is more or less an Islamic version of democracy. So there are many countries where you can continue to contest. So if you are doing good, you can contest till death. Just recently, at the age of 92, Dr. Mahathir Muhammad returned back to the corridors of power after he lived for more than 20 years. I want just to tell you that there is no limit. Because of the passat, he decided that he has to come back and set some things right. That, that passive, that foresight of the kind of society he wanted to build for Malaysia, so he decided that it is now draining. So he returned back, set it, reset it back on that face again and then leave this place now. So you can do that. It's simple. So therefore, it can be establishment. Just like they established a Nahada party in Tunisia, it can be deliberative. Deliberative is a model whereby in a situation whereby Muslims have what we call a simple majority or a significant majority. 
is just to deliberate that this is the system that we want, and then we go on and operate it, then it can be participatory. In a situation whereby you are the minority, then you can participate, because democracy has a beautiful way of accommodating pluralism, minority and majority and others. So with this meeting, uh, I'm going to stop here because of the time factor. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Babi Osili, for this eloquent uh, and enlightening presentation. Um, I think uh, some of the points uh, Dr. Babi raised are the issue of evolution from the historical perspective of democracy and how uh, it appears to be work in progress and how some of the mod models that are existing are actually tied to the historical and of course geographical context that they found uh, themselves. The second issue is um, the need to understand the gap between theory and practice of democracy. There is a lot of gap and uh, democracy in theory has some values, some ideals that it leaves to, uh, it aspires to achieve just like every other you know, system. And also Islam has these values that in terms of values at the theoretical level they don't seem to be different and in fact some of the argument is uh, these values are more elaborate, are more emphasized in the Islamic teachings than uh, in the democracy or what obtains in practice of democracy seem to fall short and that actually informs the discussion of Dr. Babi Osili around the limitations of democracy uh, as it is today. And he later concluded with this uh, idea of comparison between Islam and democracy and the arguments around, you know, jurists on the issue, or on some of the issues of democracy, issue of unity, um, uh, whether unity or uniformity in democracy, uh, issue of freedom, the idea of justice, and what have you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, Insha'Allah, we are going to break uh, for 10 minutes. Okay, we are going to break for 10 minutes, after which when we come back, we are going to take uh, the last presentation for this session from Dr. Ibrahim Duba, and then we, we, we will now, uh, after that, we'll have question and answer session. So um, we hope to see you in the next 10 minutes. Thank you. I think tea break is ready. <laughs>